Hello! Welcome to another lecture for Interactive Computer Graphics. All right, we're going to cover some interesting stuff today. We're going to talk about deferred shading, a very, very important topic. And we're going to talk about variable rate shading. We're going to talk about adaptive shading. And we're going to talk about anti-aliasing a little bit. But, but I want to start here. I want to start with, with this, the GPU graphics pipeline. You've seen this quite a few times by now, right? Our data comes in. Here's our vertex shader, rasterizer, fragment shader, and our image forms. And we extended this pipeline by adding this optional geometry shader, right? We added this geometry shader before the rasterizer. And before that, we added, we added the tessellation shaders, the tessellation control shader and tessellation evaluation shader over there. So this all the stuff that comes right before the rasterizer. And last time, we even added more stuff that came before the rasterizer. What was that? We added mesh shaders. I, actually, mesh shaders also had an optional task shader, right? So this, this is how we could generate more data. So as you can see, this part of the pipeline, the stuff that comes right before the rasterizer here, there's huge variety here because we're dealing with vertices and, and primitives. So this vertex primitive part of the pipeline, this geometry part of the pipeline, uh, is the part that we've been looking at. And we looked at a lot of stuff there to optimize every bit of computation that's going on here. But, but funny enough, most of the time, the bottleneck is not there. The bottleneck for our rendering is actually Right here, right here, fragment shading. Yeah, so <laughs> all this stuff. Okay, I, I have to say something here. Now, the problem with the geometry pipeline is that we're dealing with number of vertices and number of primitives. That's what makes the computation load here. The, the computation load is the number of vertices and number of primitives, right? Over here, our computation load is different. It's number of fragments, number of pixels right? So the efficiencies at this part of the pipeline, the geometry part of the pipeline, they're relatively easier to deal with because, well, if, if my scene is too slow to render because I have too many vertices and too many primitives, I can just render a lower resolution model. And so you can optimize the stuff that's going on here. You can accelerate this part of the pipeline by simply changing your data. I just if your scene is too heavy, too high resolution, just render a low resolution thing. Over here though, there isn't that much we can do. I mean, people are buying 4K displays today, right? Now, a lot of people are using 4K displays. Now they're, they're zooming 8K, right? And there are lots of pixels to deal with. I mean, what am I going to do? Am I going to say, uh, uh, no, I'm just going to render low resolution? Actually, <laughs> actually, people do that. <laughs> they render to a low resolution texture and then display it at high resolution on your display size. <laughs> so they didn't do that because, oh, you know, desperation. What else can you do? But this is oftentimes the bottleneck and the problems here are a little bit harder to deal with. You can't just say, oh, I'm just going to render low resolution image. I mean, yes, you lose some quality because you're user is expecting a full resolution image, right? So things here are a little harder to deal with. So that's going to be today's topic. Today, we're going to talk about how to make this part of the pipeline faster, more efficient, right? That's what our topic is going to be today. So we're going to start with deferred shading, the whole concept of deferred shading. All right, so where do we start? We start with rasterization. We're dealing with rasterization, right? So you remember how rasterization works. You get a triangle, right? And then you find the position of that triangle in the canonical view volume. But basically, you project that triangle onto the screen. That, that's what it does. And then, of course, you shade that triangle. In the fragment shader, we're going to shade that triangle and put it whatever its color is. We're going to compute that. And I'm telling you, that that might be a very expensive thing to do, very, very expensive thing to do, because that involves computing your materials and computing lighting. 
Uh, materials can be expensive to evaluate, even though, you know, blend shading, blend materials were not that expensive, but there are expensive materials out there. Beyond that, lighting, computing lighting can be very, very expensive, can be extremely expensive. So computing this, this color here, uh, that's where you spend most of your computational power on the GPU, especially if you're trying to render something that's really high quality. So, I rendered this, I, I evaluated this, it's all good, looking good. I, I did this, somehow I figured out the way to do this and it's looking good. And then, and then, the next triangle comes. And then the next triangle says, oh, you know what, I'm going to be right here. Ah, oh, what? <laughs> I spent all this time and energy just evaluating those fragments, computing their colors, and then the next triangle comes in and overwrites it. So it's completely wasted effort, right? So all this time I spent nicely rendering that triangle is gone. I mean, you can, you can think of this as like, oh, there's this castle in the background and then there's a wall in front of you. You can't see the castle. So like, why am I even rendering that, right? But it's, this is not about geometry. This is about fragment shading. So it, the, the geometry itself does not have to be complicated, but I have some fragments that I'm shading and then the next triangle comes in and guess what those triangles those fragments were not visible will not be visible in the final image i didn't actually have to shade them at all but i didn't know right so i did that ah <sighs> so how are we going to fix this so basically the problem is i'm getting my data one triangle at a time right the first triangle comes in i just put in here of course it goes through fragment shading so i i'm computing its its color its colors for these fragments and the next triangle comes in and it appears by chance possibly on top of that and i'm shading its color maybe the next one comes in and then i'll overwrite that this becomes quite inefficient so this is the concept that we call forward shading so triangles come in and and we shade them and we write their colors to the the frame buffer defer shading works the first shading works in a way to eliminate this this inefficiency of shading these fragments that won't end up in the final image so with deferred shading here's what we do i send my first triangle through this pipeline and i'm going to send this triangle it comes over here but i am not actually shading this nicely right i am just going to record as much information as i need to do the shading, that's what I'm going to record, but I'm not actually going to compute the shading because computing that shading is going to be expensive. And now my next triangle comes in and I write that. Now it's going to overwrite some of my date, some of the data that I wrote here, but that's okay. That data was easy to compute, fast to compute. I didn't do my shading yet. So we call this the forward pass. The forward pass is going to generate the data that I will need for shading. And in the next pass, we can call it a deferred pass or sometimes called shading pass or sometimes called lighting pass. Here, I am going to draw a screen size quad or sometimes like a, a triangle that covers the screen. You, you've done stuff like this. Basically, you cover the whole screen to get fragments everywhere. And then I'm going to use what I rendered before as a texture. And this is where I get my geometry information and I'm going to shade each pixel based on the geometry information I gathered here. Uh, and by shading those pixels, I get the final image. So doing this is, as you can imagine, quite a bit more advantageous because the pixels that I'm shading here, the fragments that I'm shading here, will end up at that pixel and nothing is going to override them because I'm done with the geometry pushing part of my rendering, right? So this, this forward pass pushed all the geometry. Now all the triangles end up here in this texture. And then I'm going to use this texture to do the actual final shading. And so I'm deferring the shading to this uh, later stages of the rendering process. And that's why we, we call it deferred shading, right? That's the idea. So of course the question is, what do I store here? In here, right? 
that I need to have enough information. So we call this part that the geometry buffer or, or G buffer. Uh, G buffer is the typical term for it, but it's for short for geometry buffer. What do we need? Well, I, I will need everything that I need for shading, right? So I'm going to need probably the material properties, whatever material properties I have uh, for for these triangles, like, I don't know, the diffuse color, the, the specular color, the shininess, or whatever else material properties I have for my materials, the materials that I'm using. Um, I'm probably going to need the surface normal, right? I will need the position. Well, I can sort of figure out the XY coordinates of the position in camera space based on the pixel position, but I need the depth. If I have the depth, that's going to give me the Z coordinates. So if I have the depth and the XY coming from the pixel coordinates, I, I know where that fragment is in camera space and I can transform it to whatever space I need. So I need depth at least. And I might need a few other things depending on what kind of shading operations that I'm going to be doing, right? Now, this may look like a lot of information to record. Yes, it is. So I have this fragment shader is outputting a color. <laughs> and this is like... Uh, a lot more than a color, uh, even this, just this diffuse is color on its own, right? So, <laughs> okay, this is a bit more. So what we're going to do is that we're going to generate a G buffer that's composed of multiple rendered textures. So I'm going to output multiple colors from my fragment sheet and not just one. And they're going to be recorded into multiple textures like this. And each one of these textures would encode a different part of the data that I will need for shading. Right? So that's the idea. And we can fairly easily do that. Our fragment shaders can output multiple, multiple data. All right. So there is really no standard for what goes into the G buffer. This is really application specific. Depending on what kind of rendering you're planning to do, what kind of shading operations you're planning to do, you're going to have to customize your G buffer layout accordingly. But remember that all of these will have will be screen size buffers. So if you are rendering, let's say, in 4K, these are going to be 4K images. So they are going to occupy quite a lot of space in your GPU memory. And beyond that, when you're shading them, when you're shading the pixels, you're going to have to read all of that from the GPU memory. So they're going to consume quite a lot of memory bandwidth when you're doing the final shading pass. So you kind of need to go easy on the number of textures you have here. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to have like everything I could possibly need. No, <laughs> you're going to record just as much data that you need. And you need to, you're going to have to try to compress this data as much as possible because this is going to be a lot of data. So with, with deferred shading, this can be a bottleneck. This can be a bottleneck. I'm not saying this is always a bottleneck. It's, it's not because your pixel shader, fragment shader can be very, very expensive. But just reading this data is going to cost a lot, right? So we want to optimize it. And that's going to be customized, specifically customized for the particular shading operations that you're doing. So it's going to be very application, application specific. I'm going to show you an example a relatively old example, I believe this is from 2009, um, a game called Killzone 2. Uh, this is the G buffer layout for, for that game. It's, it's using like one, two, three, four, five textures. So this depth and stencil is coming from, that's, that's coming from the depth buffer and the stencil buffer. Uh, and it's, it's using all sorts of uh, other components here. One thing to pay attention here is that, the, as you can see, the surface normal is recorded as only the X and the Y co components. And each component, X and Y, are recorded as 16-bit integers. So you basically convert the floating point X, Y, Z coordinates. You throw away the Z one because it's a unit vector, right? So if you know X, Y, you can compute Z. Particularly because Z cannot be facing backwards. It should be facing towards the camera. So you, you don't need the Z coordinate because of that. If you have X and Y. Uh, 
And for x and y, it's typical to compress them using fixed point like this. So you take a, the, the floating point value and convert it to 16-bit fixed point, and you record it there. So, and, and everything here is as compressed as possible. Uh, because you know, if you were, to, if you could possibly get rid of one of these textures, that would be an advantage. How would transparent objects work in this model, like a glass material? <laughs> yeah, it won't. <laughs> no, transparent objects won't work in this model. Yeah, that would be a problem, right? Because you would have multiple objects, multiple surfaces per pixel. That would be a problem. So you can't handle transparent objects with deferred shading. So the way we handle them is that we render everything that's opaque and then we render transparent objects. So you render everything that's opaque, finish your deferred shading, then you're ready to render your transparent objects using forward shading. Yeah, that's, that's how we do it. All right, going back here, we're dealing with, we're looking into the G buffer uh, layout of this particular game. And I'm gonna show you what these look like if you were to visualize them. Here's what they might look like, as you can see the, the diffuse component, the diffuse color. This is after you read the texture, uh, the specular intensity. So you, you do the texture lookup, but you don't do any shading computation, right? You defer all that computation. Uh, specular roughness, depth, and, and it, this one needed the motion vectors as well, and of course the normal. And when you put it all together, you get this, and, you, and after you do the final deferred shading pass, you get an image that looks like this, right? So you put everything together, uh, you get this image. This is not necessarily your final image though. Uh, a lot of times games like adding some uh, post-processing to their final images. So you take this image and then you apply some uh, image-based uh, processing. You do some, some color correct sometimes, you add some image space effects and then the final image looks more like this. So over from here, you go there. All right, so this is how you generate the, the final image. All right, so this is the idea. So you do, you have your forward pass, you generate your G buffer, and then you use your G buffer to generate your final image. How much more efficient can this be? Well, this can be very, very efficient. The, the, the thing is, when you're trying to render things, every bit counts. When you're trying to do interactive, interactive rendering, interactive graphics, every bit counts. Because imagine this, for offline computer graphics, if you're not trying to render things at interactive frame rates or real-time frame rates, for offline graphics, for special effects in movies or for uh, feature animation, a typical render time is about one hour per frame. Imagine that, one hour per frame. That's typical. It could be faster, it could be a lot slower than that, but that typically it's about one hour per frame. And we have, with 60 frames per second, we have 15 milliseconds. <laughs> we have 50 milliseconds to do something that normally takes an hour to do. Yeah, so how do we do that? Well, of course, we don't do a lot of the things that we want to do. <laughs> I mean, something's gotta give. I only have 15 milliseconds, right? So every bit counts because every saving I can do here allows me to do more. But every bit of saving that I can get here allows me to improve my shading a little more and, and get something that's closer to what I actually want to do, like super realistic uh, rendering. Now for that stuff, that yeah, so every, every bit definitely counts because imagine 15 milliseconds versus an hour and we're not even close, right? So, and, but how much can we save? We can save a lot actually. So we can save a lot. This, some, some th using deferred shading, you can easily render twice as fast. It really depends on what kind of culling you're doing, right? If you're, if you're really fragment bound, if your fragment shading is your bottleneck, uh, every fragment you shade is going to cost you 
and <laughs> and if those fragments are shaded for no good reason because uh, there's going to be some object blocking them <laughs> then you just basically wasted computation and and imagine that in it's seen even it's in a scene like this you can expect like half of the pixels to be covered by something else depending on in which order you're rendering your objects so it can help a lot but it really depends on exactly exactly what you're doing uh, but beyond that beyond that this is going to allow some different types of shading operations that are not that easy to do in the context of forward shading let me give you an example so this is um, a, a different scene showing the, a similar G buffer layout and when you combine it all together uh, you get an image that looks like this. Actually, this is not the final image. This is just the lighting. This is not including the diffuse textures. So this, this is not the final image that the game produces, but just the lighting component. Now, this is all the lighting though, right? So you did all of your shading and it seems like you're done. But no, well, not always. Sometimes, sometimes, actually oftentimes, in interactive computer graphics in, in games especially you will have a lot of light sources not just uh, just well I'm looking at this it looks like well there was just one maybe sunlight I don't really see much else but typically there's going to be quite a few light sources and light sources are that if 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 it's if it's not the sun if the light source is not the sun it's going to have relatively limited influence radius right so a, a light source a hold in your hand it's going to have it's going to eliminate things around it but beyond a certain distance its impact is going to be quite limited so uh, the way we handle this for interactive rendering just to make things a little bit faster is that beyond a certain distance we just ignore the contribution of that light source so if I have a light source and I'm holding a light source Beyond a certain distance, I'm going to say, you know what, I, I don't care. This, this light does not illuminate anything beyond that distance because its, its impact is going to be really minor anyway. Now, this allows me to, to use a lot of light sources in my scene because not all light sources will eliminate everything in the scene, right? A, a particular position in the scene will be eliminated by a relatively small number of light sources. Not all of the lights in my scene. Now, I can use deferred shading, the idea of deferred shading, to do additional lighting on top of my, my default lighting. So here, this image contains the, the, the sunlight, and it, all the shading is done with that light. But I have a lot more light sources in my scene. Let's say, for this character, for this character, if you look at the, uh, the, the eyes, they're actually supposed to be glowing, so there are lights. So, and they're not going to eliminate the whole scene, but they are going to eliminate things around them. So the way that we're going to handle those, that they, they handle this uh, in this game, is that after this pass is done, they're drawing spheres, spheres in the shape of these light sources. That, that, this is the influence radius of that light source. So I'm drawing that sphere, but I am not going to shade that sphere itself. What this sphere does here is that it creates some fragments for me to shade. That's, that's all its job. Its job is to create some fragments for me to shade. And I'm going to use deferred shading to shade them. For, for each one of those fragments, I'm going to look at my G buffer, find out what object is in that G buffer, and I'm going to shade that object using this light source, this new light source I added, right? But this light source is not going to eliminate anything else in the scene, right? So I don't have to generate fragments that cover the entire scene. I'm just generating fragments for the influence radius of this particular light source, right? And then I am going to shade those fragments with that light source, so I basically computed the elimination of that light source. So there's one more here. So I draw another another one like that, and I shade this one. And I'm, you you we talked we talked about how to do lighting with multiple light sources. Basically, when you have an additional light source, 
you just add all the all the reflected light from the light sources from the surface light coming to a surface from all of the light sources we just add them together we just add the reflected light right so basically you just add uh, the contributions of these light sources so i added the second light and i'm going to add its reflected light from all these surfaces starting with this light source and i've got add the other one and shade that one so these these three spheres we added they're going to be combined with the final image with an additive blending so you compute those fragments and their colors and their colors will be added on top of the existing colors in the frame buffer so by, by doing so, I am able to handle multiple light sources fairly efficiently. Now, if I didn't do deferred shading with forward shading, this would have been quite a bit more difficult to handle, right? Because for every fragment, I need to figure out, all right, so I have all these light sources in my scene, which light sources could illuminate this fragment? I need to figure that out. And that could be expensive. I mean, there, there are ways to accelerate those computations, don't get me wrong. It, it, you don't have to do this in a brute force manner. But nonetheless, there's going to be additional computation to figure that out, at least. So at least I'm going to have to consider the possibility of that any fragment being influenced by, being illuminated by any of the light sources in the scene. So there's going to be some additional costs there as well. And differentiating sort of allows us to do this sort of thing uh, quite a bit more efficiently. And as I said, this is not atypical, actually. Like in games, you will see a lot of light sources, and all of these light sources will have relatively limited influence radius. There's going to be some lights that are going to be eliminating the whole scene, but most of the other smaller light sources, a large number of the light sources will have limited influence radius, uh, radii. And because of that, we can use deferred shading to accelerate handling those light sources. So, do people like deferred shading? Does anybody use deferred shading in practice? I mean, this sounds like a good idea, but it's anybody using? Do they use in games? Yeah, yeah, they do. This is pretty much the standard. I'm just, just pick one game here, Cyberpunk. No, this is not from 2077. <laughs> Uh, this game came out uh, last December, I believe. Was it December, November? Anyhow, very recently, at the end of 2020. December 10th, okay. December 10th, 2020. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, deferred shading, and this is the apparently that the, what the G buffer looks like. <laughs> uh, not a particularly appealing image from that 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 video game that I've, that, are, that this is the final image that corresponds to that g buffer layout but whatever that probably if i wanted to showcase this game this is this wouldn't be the the, the scene that i would pick from it there are much nicer scenes but anyhow my, my point is here is not to promote this game all right <laughs> that's not the point the point is yeah it's it's used in games differentiating it's everywhere so <laughs> Unreal Engine 4 comes with deferred shading. Like you can do deferred deferred shading with, with Unity as well. So basically today deferred shading is the standard for rendering, uh, for real-time rendering, especially in games. So one problem that happens with deferred shading is that anti-aliasing becomes quite hard. What? Aliasing, anti-aliasing? I'm talking about these jaggedy edges. You see, you see those really jaggedy edges here. Uh, over here in this one, they, they, the the edges of these grass blades look kind of smooth, and over here they're like they're like <laughs> staircase, right? So the aliasing term, the term aliasing, anti-aliasing, that it, it comes from signal processing, but I'm I'm not going to get into that because I think there are more intuitive ways of thinking about al aliasing in the context of computer graphics. So that's what we're going to do. But um, so these jaggedy stuff is happening because I am doing one shading per pixel effectively, right? With deferred shading. So that pixel is going to be, in this case, either a part of a grass blade or whatever is in the background, right? So I'm deciding what to shade per pixel. <laughs> 
and I don't have anything in between. And that's going to create these, these jaggedy edges. So anti-aliasing becomes a big problem with deferred shading. So let's talk about, let's talk about aliasing. Uh, actually, you know what? We're talking about, we're going to talk about anti-aliasing, right? <laughs> anti-aliasing. So uh, the, the concept is quite simple. I'm just talking about this because we haven't really talked about it in detail in this course. So this is a good time to do that, I think. So if I take a triangle like this and I render it using my favorite rendering algorithm, it doesn't have to be a rasterization. I render it into, a, into an image. It's, this is a very low resolution image, obviously. So I'm going to get these jaggedy edges. And with rasterization, what I have here per pixel is that I have the RGBA color and the depth value, but depth buffer, right? Z buffer rasterization. And this color and depth actually are samples exactly at the center of each pixel. So that's, that's what I'm storing, right? So if a different, another triangle comes along, I can do the depth test and I can figure out which one's in front. But in the end, all of these pixels are, the, their colors are, are determined by what they have exactly at their centers. So if there's nothing at their centers, then I have nothing for that pixel. Uh, and for wh whatever triangle is visible through the center of the pixel, that's, that's what I see. So this doesn't really give me a, a smooth image with smooth edges that look like this, right? So an, an image that look like this could be generated if I were to consider what percentage of these triangles were overlapping with each pixel, right? So that's the concept of anti-aliasing in the context of rendering. So if I were to consider what percentage of my triangles were overlapping with each pixel area, then I would get a, a better approximation of, that, what that, of what that pixel color is supposed to be. Right? And that would give me an image that does not look jaggedy anymore. It actually looks, looks like it has smooth edges. Of course, yeah, you know, this is a low resolution image, right? It's, it's, this is not going to look like that. I mean, it's not going to happen because I have limited number of pixels. But at least I don't have these staircase artifacts, right? And, and that helps a lot, actually. When you look at something like this, and if these pixels are relatively small, you won't be able to see these pixels, but you will just see a smooth edge. But if you don't have anti-aliasing, you will be able to see these the, the pixelated edges and that doesn't look quite right, right? So how can we do this? How can we do this? Well, obviously, if I have a single sample per pixel, that sample being exactly at the center of a pixel, this is not gonna work out, right? I'm not gonna get this. So that's a solution to that for rendering is one solution is super sampling that means i have more samples per pixel in this case i'm i'm showing four but gpus can do more than four super sampling uh, actually for offline rendering 64 is often considered a, a good number for super sampling with 64 samples per pixel you get a good approximation of what that pixel color is supposed to be wow now, the problem here is that now this is expensive, right? This is a lot more expensive than just using a single sample. Because I have a lot more samples now, but the image looks a lot better than this. I don't have these jaggedy artifacts anymore. I don't have these staircase artifacts. The image looks a lot better, but now I have, in this case, four times more samples to do the Z test and then to shade. So guess what? My shading cost was expensive. Now I'm doing four times per pixel. <laughs> That's a lot more expensive now. Not very good. So one solution to that is this brilliant idea, I think, is instead of using super sampling. Now, why am I doing super sampling? I don't necessarily care about the color variation between these sub-pixel samples. What I care about is what is visible through them what percentage of these samples will see my triangle? 
That's what I'm interested in, right? I'm not interested in the variation of that triangle color. In this example, there's no variation for triangle color. The triangle is either blue or red, right? But I want to know what percentage of it is covered. So instead of evaluating four times the color and four times the depth buffer, I can compute just one color per pixel, but four times the depth. So, and this is called multi-sample anti-aliasing. It's not super sample, it's multi-sample. So with multi-sample anti-aliasing, MSAA, I'm going to have more depth samples that will tell me the coverage of each pixel, but then I'm going to do shading only one time per triangle. So if, even if this triangle is overlapping with four of the sub-pixel samples, I'm just going to shade that, that pixel once to compute this one color. All right? But I'm going to be storing a lot more depth buffer value. Yes, I'm going to be doing that. But at least I'm not increasing the shading cost unnecessarily. Right? And obviously, if there are multiple triangles that correspond to the same pixel, yeah, if I have two triangles that correspond to the same pixel, I'm going to shade that pixel twice. One for one triangle, one for the other triangle. Yes, I'm going to have to do that. But, but I'm not shading it four times, even in that case. Right? So there's huge saving. And this is 4x MSAA. I can do 16x MSAA. I'm not going to be shading 16 times. I'm just going to be shading it two times. So this actually is super efficient. So MSAA becomes very, very effective. So super sample anti-aliasing, that's the brute force way of doing anti-aliasing. MSAA is the sort of clever way of handling this, ignoring all the sub-pixel sub -pixel variations of color. And, and, and then you get much more efficient shading with MSAA. So that's great. But these are not all the anti-aliasing options though. But this is... These are anti-aliasing options that are supported natively by the GPU. And uh, guess what? They are sort of incompatible with deferred shading. Because I have one sample per pixel with deferred shading. That means I can't do anti-aliasing. Am I doomed? Well, sort of, but not completely. I can start to do things, kind of. Well, I can do... Uh, uh, other sort of anti-aliasing things like uh, this FXAA or MLAA, this morphological or fast approximate anti-aliasing. That's the concept. I'm not going to tell you the details, but it's the concept of blending the colors of neighboring pixels. Because this jaggedy edges appear when you're at a silhouette edge of an object. So maybe you can smooth those edges by just blending the colors of neighboring pixels. That's the idea for morphological anti-aliasing. There's also TAA or TXAA, temporal anti-aliasing. Temporal anti-aliasing will look at the previous frame and, and see how that differs. Well, you will think, why should it differ? It's still the same sample in the previous frame. Yes, it would be the same sample in the previous frame and it won't differ, but we add a little bit of jitter to our camera. So you move your camera just a little bit, just a little bit to one side so that your pixel centers are still pixel centers, but they're looking at slightly different positions in, in, the, in the scene. So you're going to get some, some variation. So with temporal anti-aliasing, your camera will move like this constantly. I mean, very little, you won't be able to see it, but those pixel samples, the pixel center will change position. So by blending the, the colors of previous frames, you can get nice anti-aliasing. This is actually, this is pretty much the standard today. Like everybody uses temporal anti-aliasing because well, we're using deferred shading and we need anti-aliasing. Right? <laughs> so, this is the, the best option that's available to us. Of course, it has its own problems. It's not, it's, it's not free of problems. Uh, it has its own problems that I'm not planning to get into. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you can read about that. Um, temple anti-aliasing is not perfect, but it's for static, in static case, it does a pretty good job. But MSAA is actually very good idea, very good idea. And this can be used for reducing the shading cost a bit more. Now, like from super sampled anti-aliasing, SSAA to MSAA, 
I am reducing the shading cost, right? With super sample anti-aliasing, I'm shading each sub-pixel sample. Here, I'm just shading each pixel once. Per each fragment once per pixel. So, I'm reducing the shading cost, right? Instead of shading all of them, I'm shading just some of them. Now, you can take this idea one step further. If you take that idea one step further, we get variable rate shading. So I'm calling it MSAA++. Nobody else calls it, I believe. <laughs> but it's a good way of thinking about it, really. It's just uh, MSAA, but a higher level. So what if I were to do the same trick for not just subsamples of one pixel, but for samples of multiple pixels? Like, imagine something like this in, in the scene. I could say, you know what? Some of these pixels, some, of, some, some part of the scene is too high resolution. I don't have that much detail visible in my scene. And some places are just, eh, blah. You know, some places are just, just seeing the background and maybe the background has a constant color. The road is sort of flat and there's not that much change in color. So how about instead of, shading each and every pixel, I group some pixels and just shade once for a group of pixels. So these are the different types of variable rate shading levels that are available to us on the GPU today. So we could do one times one, that means shade every pixel, or two by two, it means you have a two by two region of pixels and you shade only once, right? Four by four is probably your overdoing it <laughs> but maybe maybe that's good enough and there's also these rectangular options too and the, the way this works is really really just like MSAA so imagine a lovely rainbow triangle like this not quite rainbow but close uh, so I am shading this triangle uh, let's do uh, let's say that I'm doing variable rate shading one by one. That means I'm shading every pixel. This is what I get. Now, if I do two by two variable rate shading, I'm going to render two by two blocks. I'm going to shade them only once. So as you can see, the shading position is now at the center of these two by two blocks. And all of the pixels within the same two by two block will get exactly the same color because I'm doing one shading operation. I'm just assigning the same color to all of them, just like MSAA. MSAA does the same thing at the sub-pixel level. This is bringing it to multiple pixels, blocks of pixels, right? Uh, but as you can see, the triangle, triangle still looks like the same triangle. Like over here in 1v1, this is what it looked like, right? It's the still, still the same triangle shape but I am shading it differently. So just like MSAA, I am figuring out which, pic which triangle is visible for each pixel using pixel samples, right? And then for shading, and for shading only, I am doing this low resolution operation, low resolution shading. So let's take it to four by four. Uh, you, you get this, like I'm, four by four blocks, they will get the same color. So uh, this actually saves a lot of computation time. You can reduce your, your shading rate quite a bit, so you don't have to shade each and every pixel here. So this is so much better than deferred shading in that sense. With deferred shading, we guarantee that we're shading each pixel only once, right? With this, we're not even shading all of the pixels. That, that's even better than that. And, and imagine that a lot of people are using super high resolution displays today and pixels are really, really small. And sometimes those pixels don't really carry that much information. And like that is a lot of the pixels here. If you look at this, they're very, the, their colors are very similar to the pixels right next to them. So it sort of makes sense to use something like this to, instead of evaluating each and every pixel separately, kind of makes sense to put them in groups and assign the same color to them, right? So that's the, that's the idea. And by doing that, uh, 
we can significantly reduce the, the shading cost. But don't you get some artifacts out of this? Well, if you're careful, not. And this is probably going to go through some post-processing. Remember, I showed you post-processing, uh, one example post-processing. So you, you can take this rendered image and apply some maybe motion blur effects and things like that, like smudge some parts of the image a little bit. So uh, in the end, whatever artifacts that you get out of that may not be that visible. Maybe you might be able to hide them if you pick your shading rates carefully. All right, there, there are different ways of handling it and different APIs handle it differently. Uh, with, with DirectX, there's tier one. Tier one, I believe, allows you to set the shading rates per draw call. So whenever you say draw, draw whatever triangles, you can say, oh, draw triangles, but do this level of variable rate shading. So you can specify it per draw call like that, or you can specify it per primitive, that's tier two. Uh, in, the, in the geometry shader or vertex shader, you can say, oh, I would like this primitive to be shaded with whatever shading rate did you pick. So tier two will allow that, but the, the most common one that's, I believe, supported by all of the APIs is the image-based one. The thing is, for variable rate shading to work, GPU needs to know which shading rate to use where. Yeah. So it's like, I, I don't know what shading rate to use, like when you're setting triangles, right? You kind of need to specify that information. So you, you provide an information to to the GPU, and typically you provide it as an image. So you can see some, some blocks here. So these blocks are, I believe these are eight by eight pixel blocks. Maybe they are larger than that now, but uh, it with, uh, I believe the standard for VRS is eight by eight blocks of pixels. So for an eight by eight block of pixel, you can say, I want one of these shading rates, whatever one you want. And you can specify that as a, as an image to the render and say, oh, while you're rendering the scene, use this shading rate for these parts of, of the image, these parts of the, the final rendered image. Now that's a little bit of a problem, of course, because, well, now I need to know what shading rate to use where. I haven't rendered the scene yet, so I don't know. Like, how would I know? So I may need to render a version of the scene and figure things out. So, but that all of that complexity is basically given to the to the user. Say, so like, you want to render the scene with relatively low shading rate? You you figure it out. You you tell me that if you tell the GPU to use one of these lower shading rates, it's capable of doing that. But you kind of need to. You're going to have to figure out when to use what. So that's uh, that responsibility is left with the programmer who is designing this rendering. So you need to write some code to figure that out. But if you do this right, if you figure out how to tell GPU when to use what shading rate, then you can actually get quite a bit of saving. That's the, that's the idea. So variable rate shading is great and you can use it for deferred shading. Definitely, you can use it for deferred shading. You just need to figure out what shading rate to use somehow. Uh, it's sort of, I would say it works better with forward shading because the nice thing here is that it, even though you're reducing the shading rates, because it operates like MSAA, it's not going to blur out your edges. So if I have a silhouette edge of an object, and if I pick a low shading rate with forward shading, I'm still going to get the same, same edge. Right, same edge is going to appear because if there are multiple triangles that correspond to a block of pixels with low shading rate, a variable rate shading will still shade both of those triangles. Right, If there are two triangles, they will shade both of those triangles. So it works just fine with forward shading. It's a little more tricky with deferred shading though. So if with deferred shading, I can use VRS, but if I have a silhouette edge of an object and I say, oh, use... I don't know, four by four shading rate there, 
uh, that that edge will be just uh, overridden by a block, <laughs> right? That you will totally lose that edge because we're doing differentiating, and differentiating edges don't exist anymore, right? We got rid of the geometry pass. We done with the geometry pass in the final shading pass. I don't have any of the edges anymore, right? So it's it, it's it's a little more tricky to use it in differentiating context. But then differentiating pass. The, the forward pass in the first shading, the first pass can be used to figure out where I will need higher shading rate. So in that sense, it could be helpful. Um, triangle edges are preserved. That's a very nice thing about variable rate shading. It's the geometric edges, the geometric discontinuities, it will preserve those. Uh, and it works better with large triangles. When you have large triangles, you're not going to have you're not going to have blocks of pixels that correspond to multiple triangles because if i have a triangular mesh i'm running a triangular mesh with a high resolution triangular mesh with lots of small triangles then every every block of let's say 2 by 2 shading rate every block of 2 by 2 will have a lot of triangles in them so i'm going to be shading them multiple times anyway so yeah, I, I sort of lose the benefits of variable rate shading when that happens. So it works better with relatively low resolution models um, and works a little better with forward shading, I would say. Now that brings us to a fictional topic <laughs> that is adaptive shading. Now, why am I calling this fictional? I'll, I'll tell you. Um, so this is a, an, an idea that... Um, we proposed a couple of years back and presented the HPG in 2018, I believe. The idea here is that when you look at an image like this, what well, I have to talk about my, my research on this very topic because I have solutions to some of these problems, right? So I, I kind of need to talk about that. Uh, so deferred, adaptive deferred shading is the idea that when you're doing the first shading, you don't necessarily need to shade every pixel. Very much like variable ray shading, but not, not quite. So you can generate an image that looks very much like this by shading some of the pixels. So I'm highlighting which pixels are shaded here. The white ones are shaded, the black ones are not shaded. So what do I do with the black ones? I just interpolate the neighboring pixel colors. So in the end, if you were to compare what you get with adaptive deferred shading versus full shading every pixel. I'm zooming in here so you can see the pixel level details. You can see that all the details are in there. So what's, what's missing here? Well, with adaptive deferred shading, in this case, we are shading half of the pixels on, on average. So in some places we have more shading, in some places we have less shading. But if you pay really close attention like some of the details here, like some of the grain on, on that hill is sort of lost over there. You see that it's a little too smooth. Now that grain is lost. But all the high frequency details, like more sharper details, more obvious details are perfectly preserved because it's, it's adaptive. And here's how it works. Here's how it works. The, here's the idea. So... We are starting with, let's say, this is the image that we're trying to render, right? These are our pixels. So we're going to start with a very low shading rate. So we're going to shade some of these pixels. We're going to shade every four pixel in a row and every four row. One of every four row. And we're going to shade all of them. So all of these pixels, they will be shaded. No question. Right. That's where we started. Good. Now we have, we know the colors of these pixels. We shaded them properly. We know their colors, but this is a very, very low shading rate, as you can see, right? So just one sixteenth of all the pixels are shaded now. Now we're going to look at the pixels right in the middle of them. We're going to look at these pixels right in the middle. And for each one of them, we're going to look at the neighboring pixels, neighboring pixels that are already shaded. Now, if their colors are similar, or if, the, if we deem that somehow these pixels are similar, then I'm going to say, you know what, I'm not going to shade it. But if they are different, somehow I, I, I say that these pixels look different, and I'm going to shade that. Now, this whether or not a pixel looks different is 
well, that depends on your similarity criteria. You can just look at the final pixel colors. Actually, that works surprisingly well. Or you can just look at other things like surface normals, material IDs, or material roughness, or whatever, whatever information you want to look at, or, or depth value, or whatever information you can look at, you can decide whether or not that pixel needs to be shaded, whether or not these four pixels are similar. If they are similar, I'm not gonna, if they are similar, I'm not gonna shade it, I'm just gonna interpolate their values. If they're different, I'm going to shade it. So in the end, if you look at all of these pixels, you shade some of them, you interpolate some of them, by interpolating the colors, the neighboring colors, you basically get rid of the expensive shading operation. And in the end, we have these pixels. You go to one higher level. In this case, we're looking at these pixels in the middle. And again, we're, for each one of them, we're gonna look at the four neighboring ones. We're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna decide whether or not to shade and some of them will get shaded, some of them won't be shaded. And then we get all these colors and then you look at the next level Again, you'll look at the neighboring ones and you decide whether or not to shade and the final level will look at these. And again, you just decide to shade some of them. And in the end, you produce your final image, you shade everything. So we talked about this idea in 2018 as a, a way of doing this in um, a compute shader. So uh, my student, Ian Millet, uh, implemented this as a compute shader implementation of deferred shading. And you want to implement this in a compute shader instead of a fragment shader because the, the, the order in which we're shading the pixels is a little bit different. And using a compute shader, we're explaining how uh, we could get the most uh, SIMD performance, SIMD efficiency from our GPU cores by uh, some, some clever way of figuring out which pixels to shade and accumulating enough pixels to shade and then doing shading in parallel with a group of pixels. So that's, that's the idea. So you can implement the final shading pass of deferred shading in a compute shader for implementing our own pixel scheduling so that we, we can implement adaptive, adaptive shading. And by, by doing so, we could significantly reduce shading rate. Last year, much more recently, we actually talked about how this could be implemented in hardware, how we could have GPU hardware support uh, for adaptive, adaptive deferred shading. Well, you could say, well, we have VRS now, why do we need adaptive deferred shading? Because this provides much better quality, so much better quality. Let me, let me show you. Now, this is the result of deferred adaptive compute shading. I'm gonna flip to VRS results uh, but before I do that, let me tell you, this is shading, I believe, only half of the pixels. VRS will also shade half of the pixels. And we used an, an uh, optimization algorithm to figure out which pixels, which shading rate to use for VRS to get the most best quality we could possibly get out of VRS. Now, that's hard to do in, in reality, right? When you're actually trying to render a scene, you kind of need to figure out what to, to shade before you shade. But we made that decision after we shaded. Like we compared the results and we picked, what if I knew exactly what to do in the best possible way with VRS? What could we possibly achieve? Are you ready? From here we go to here, right? From here to here. From here to here. Can you see the difference? It's hard to see. All right, let me zoom in. Let me zoom in and show you the differences. All right. So on, on this side, you see deferred adaptive compute shading. And on this side, you are seeing VRS with deferred shading. With deferred shading. Because it's deferred shading, the edges, you, yeah, VRS will not automatically resolve your silhouette edges for you, right? Over here, you can see that. The, the edges can get messed up if you don't pick the right shading rate for them. But again, the, the overall shading rate for both of these methods will be the same. A lot of geometric detail is getting lost with VRS when you're, doing, when you're using deferred shading. Some of the texture detail is getting lost with VRS and, and the, the door handle here is lost and all that. With variable rate shading, you can preserve the triangle edges if you're doing forward shading. With deferred shading, 
unfortunately, all these triangle edges are gone. Yeah. So, in the context of deferred shading, VRS is not helping that much. And adaptive shading, when that's available on our GPUs, hopefully, will do a lot more. Well, it's not available today on the GPU. It's not, we don't have automatic support for uh, adaptive deferred shading, but this deferred adaptive compute shading is implemented on the GPU, runs on the GPU, using a compute shader implementation of, of deferred shading. So yeah, today you can do that. You just need to write your own scheduler in software. And that is a little bit tricky because you kind of need to figure out what would be the, the best scheduling algorithm for your GPU. Uh, and that is the, the tricky bit in terms of getting the most performance out of deferred adaptive compute shading. Um, so you kind of need to understand your GPU and what kind of scheduling works, works best. So um, last year we talked about how we could do all of this stuff in the GPU, on the GPU itself. Like the GPU could have direct support for adaptive, defer de adaptive deferred shading so that we won't have to figure out the best scheduling algorithm for our GPU and we won't have to write that scheduler in software in our compute shader and uh, GPU could do that a lot better. That's, that's the idea. So if there's direct GPU support. And yeah, deferred adaptive compute shading or adaptive deferred shading, it, that's, that's not going to work for forward shading at all, right? So that, that's, that only works for, for deferred shading. Uh, so basically, that, that's what we've been advocating for, having a direct hardware support for deferred shading. And I think it's time. We've been using deferred shading long enough, it's like everywhere now, so it kind of makes sense to have a direct API support for deferred shading, why not? All right, so this is all of the stuff that I plan to cover for today, all that material that, and as you can see, this was all about figuring out ways to make fragment shading less expensive in practice, that is minimizing the number of fragment shading operations that we can do because the fragment shading can be the bottleneck. Now, I told you that fragment shading can be the bottleneck, but I did not tell you why. I mean, I told you some things. I told you that, yeah, materials can be expensive, lighting can be expensive. How exactly? Well, we're gonna talk about that. Next time around, we're gonna talk about realistic lighting computation with global illumination. And you will, you will know immediately why it takes about an hour to render a frame in offline rendering <laughs> and why we need probably more than 15 milliseconds but we don't get to have more than 15 milliseconds uh, in real-time rendering on the gpu uh, so we're going to and, and we're going to talk about what we could do with the time that we have with the available resources that we have on the gpu uh, to achieve high quality rendering with realistic lighting simulation. That's going to be our topic for next time. So next, I, today I'll tell you that fragment shading is expensive and next time you will know why. <laughs> All right, any uh, questions, comments, complaints? <laughs> All right, this is a question about, uh, do I get anything if GPU manufacturers were to uh, implement any of my ideas? Uh, well, no, no, I, well, it, it depends. So if you apply for a patent, then whoever wants to use your idea would need to, would need to somehow license that patent or buy that patent from you and stuff like that. I, I don't do that. A lot of researchers don't do that. Um, I would like people, I'm, I'm trying to solve computer graphics problems. I, and I'm, solving them, making them public, and putting them in publications. So whoever wants to grab them and use them and benefit out of them, they can do that. And But I can tell you something. I have this idea of I deferred, uh, adaptive deferred shading. We talked about, we explained how to, how to do that, how to implement it on the GPU. And if the GPU manufacturers go and implement it, I'm gonna have hardware support for adaptive deferred shading on my next GPU, and I'm gonna be happy. 
So that, that's what I get out of this. <laughs> the, the thing is this, this is, this is my job. This is what I do. Uh, as, a, as a researcher, this is typically what you do in pretty much any field, right? So in computer graphics, that I look at computer graphics related problems. Um, and in, in other fields, people look at other types of problems. So in, in some of these fields, you can expect the researchers to get some benefit out of them, like monetary benefit out of them. <laughs> in some cases, you expect the researchers to not get anything because, hey, this is like public service. Uh, you should not get anything, right? Um, uh, in, in the end, it, it, whether, whether or not a, a researcher that comes up with the idea gets anything out of that idea, it's, that depends. But you definitely get some satisfaction. And I would, uh, I, I, I want to think that I'm solving real problems and I'm providing practical solutions to real problems. And if those problems find their ways into real world applications, like in actual GPU hardware, <laughs> that will make me happy, yes. So I do get something out of that. In, in that part. All right. So uh, next time I'll tell you a few a few other things that um, that, that we've done in the context of global animation. So um, we'll talk about global animation next time. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for joining. I'm going to end it here, and I'll see you all next time.